Um, my name is Alex Chatello. I'm just waiting for the presentation to load here, but I'm going to go through a couple of um, quick tech tips for everyone. If you need any assistance during the course of this um, conversation today, feel free to email us at FEMA. Dash 2021 HM workshop at fema.dhs.gov. There's a dial in um, underneath. You can see Mari up in the upper left hand uh, corner. There's a phone number underneath here if you want to dial in. And it looks like they have two files for download. So um, if there's anything that you want to download, you can go to that pod and grab it there. Other than that, I'm going to hand this over to you, Mari. Great, thank you so much. And good afternoon from the East Coast, or good morning if you're further west. Um, this is starting your mitigation story with scoping your mitigation plan. Considerations for state, local, and tribal has a mitigation plan development and updates. Um, I'm Mari Radford. I'm the community planning lead for FEMA Region 3. Region 3 includes Pennsylvania, Virginia, DC, Delaware, West Virginia, and Maryland. And let me let uh, Brenna introduce herself. Well, good morning, everyone. I am based here on the West Coast, so it's still uh, morning over here. We're really happy to be with you today. As Mari said, my name is Brenna Meneghini, and I am our um, team lead for our non-disaster grants and hazard mitigation assistant in Region 10. So what that is is PDMs, older grants, flood mitigation assistance, and now BRIC. Um, my region covers Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and Alaska. And I'm really happy to be here today and talk with everyone about um, planning and planning updates. So uh, Mari and I section can kind of cross collaborate to make sure that your plans and your planning applications are, are both successful. Over to you, Mari. Thanks, Brenna. Uh, next slide, please. We're going to start off with a poll question so that we can uh, get to know the level of expertise and exposure you have with hazard mitigation planning before we start the conversation. So we have about a minute, and we uh, will then share with you the results. And it looks like the responses are starting to slow down. Just have a few more seconds. And I think we can end the poll at any time now. So it looks like the majority of you are somewhere in the middle here. Um, you've heard of planning, maybe participated uh, before, maybe you've worked on several, but uh, not a lot of people at either end of the spectrum. So that gives us a good place to start this conversation. Uh, next slide, please. So successful hazard mitigation planning requires doing some pre-planning uh, to create the right approach. And um, this discussion this afternoon is going to talk about um, these objectives. So first of all, you need to know what is in a plan, what are the requirements, um, and maybe even to think about including some best practices that might have been uh, identified in your last plan review by your state or FEMA. Um, you need to know when you need to begin. Um, there is a clear expiration date for all plans. You need to give yourself plenty of time to allow yourself to go through the planning process. And you may even need to allow a little bit of extra time if you're looking for outside funding to help that. You need to understand the right, how to right size the scope of work for your plan. So we're going to talk a lot about that, um, how to identify um, the level of complexity that's needed for your plan. Um, you don't need to say, take the same approach every single update. And to make sure that you're matching the tasks and resources that you, you need to complete the plan and have the, the, right, the right level there. Um, we're also going to share with you some resources that you can use. Next slide, please. And I do want to add, um, if you have questions or comments, put them in the chat. Um, we would love to hear more. So this presentation is in response to a disconnect that we have observed within the planning process. You know, how to more clearly ma map out your planning needs 
before you actually start your planning. Um, we really want to help communities and plan developers set expectations early as a scope of uh, work is written um, to create a clear path to a plan that represents their needs and the steps towards resilience. So the image you're seeing here um, is a metaphor for your plan, uh, your mitigation program. Mitigation planning uh, will provide a roadmap for decision makers in your community. So you start by thinking about uh, recent disasters, changes in risk and development and populations in your community. Have you new priorities, um, new partners, new challenges? You may be using a FEMA planning grant, or you may be self-funding. But either way, you need to start with this step so that you have um, a clear path moving forward. Next, you're going to understand that you are working towards getting a FEMA-approved hazard mitigation plan. The journey, and that means the planning process, will help build risk awareness in your community and buy-in to support mitigation action. Involving the right stakeholders is key so that they can help implement actions through both public and private resources. Once you have an approved hazard mitigation plan, you will start implementing planning-related activities. This could include, uh, such as an HMA-supported project scoping, which used to be advanced assistance. And that can help you better define solutions for your community. As you ascend towards resilience, it's going to take mitigation investment using both FEMA and other sources, such as public and private. Um, success is going to be incremental. And one of the good things about the five-year planning update cycle is it can provide you a structure to measure that progress. Next slide, please. So, um, Hazard mitigation plans are a living roadmap to saving lives, protecting property, and your future. And I'll point out that for many communities, this may be the only predictable planning mechanism they have in their communities. So it might be filling a lot of other um, needs as well. But um, we know that hazard mitigation plans get updated every five years, so that's a great place to start. If you will click next, please. We're going to focus today on these two, this two years of the five-year planning cycle, years three and four. Um, this is where you lay the groundwork for your next plan update. Um, and in particular, if you are using hazard mitigation assistance funding, you need to allocate about a year for the application process. So it's really important that you be thinking about this sooner rather than later. Next slide, please. So not every community um, chooses to use hazard mit mitigation assistance funding, um, but you're going to have to ask the same questions no matter how you choose to fund your plan. You need to ask who's going to do the work and how is it going to be funded? Uh, will it be work done by internal staff, or are you going to bring on contractors um, to help with this planning effort? Will you pay for that using budgeted funds, or are you going to look for outside funding? Hazard mitigation assistance planning grants can be used for plan development, um, but you can't use those for existing staff who are already doing this work. Click, please. And regardless of how you are planning to fund your project, uh, you need to have an understanding of the scope of the plan um, project before you get started. So the scope of work is your narrative. Um, and that tells you how your plan is going to be developed. It identifies the tasks that you will need to accomplish to make this happen. It's going to identify the budget and the timeline that will be based on this, these tasks. Um, and that all rolls in together for this scope of work. When you're planning or funding um, and, it coming, and it's coming from external sources, it's going to be really important that you have a clear scope, budget, and timeline. Even if the project is going to be done um, by existing staff members in the course of their normal job, this is going to give you a very clear roadmap of what that outcome is going to look like. 
Um, you want to make sure that you are not taking more time and resources than it needs, and that in particular you get your plan to approval before it expires. And if you are submitting an HMA grant, how well these three components fit together is one of the things that your application is going to be judged on. Next slide, please. So now we're going to talk about right-sizing your plan or plan update. Next slide, please. So every um, mitigation plan has the same components, but not every mitigation plan or plan update is going to take the same level of effort. The level of effort and the cost is going to depend on how complex your plan will be. A low complexity planning project may take less time and fewer resources than a medium complexity plan. And that will take even less resources than a high complexity plan. So let's break these down and show you what we mean. Next slide, please. So the goal is for you to right size your planning effort, but not to compromise on the quality of the plan. You want a good plan, and you want one that will lead to lower risk in your community. But you also want a plan that's finished on time and doesn't cost more than is necessary. What will it take to get that done? That is going to depend on a number of things. The more blue arrows you have on this graphic, the more likely it is that you are going to need more resources. So first of all, ask yourself, is this a new plan or a plan update? New plans will obviously take more resources because you're starting with a blank slate. A update may take fewer resources depending on other factors, which we're going to look at. A uh, multi-jurisdictional plan is going to be more complicated because not all communities uh, are the same. And if you have a large area or large population in your planning um, district, then you're going to find that it's going to have more diverse needs, and that will add to the complexity. Next slide, please. So um, some additional factors to consider when you're talking about the complexity of your plan. Um, you need to be looking at economic and uh, demographic changes that have occurred, because that can impact the vulnerabilities in your community. Some examples are uh, maybe an older population um, might be less mobile, and if your population is getting older, that will impact um, your response to hazards. A population of recent refugees may not be as familiar with the hazards of the area and may need additional resources to receive or understand warnings. A new industry coming into your community might bring new hazards. You need to also ask yourself, is new data available? Um, because it's going to take time to analyze it and understand how it relates to hazard mitigation. For example, you might have new flood insurance rate maps that show additional properties or critical infrastructure at risk of flooding. You need to ask if you have the expertise within your planning team, because that can make all the difference. Um, even if you're bringing in an outside contractor, that outside contractor is not the expert in your community. That's where you need a strong planning team that brings that outside knowledge, brings that inside knowledge. The contractor, though, can help guide you through the planning process and help bring together all of those pieces. Next slide, please. Finally, for plan updates. Um, the things that have happened in your community since the last plan was adopted can also affect complexity. If there's been a lot of hazard activity, those events will need to be researched and put into the context of the mitigation plan. And then you need to ask yourself, have you pro progressed with your mitigation actions from the last plan? How has that reduced the risk in your community? You may need to reassess the earlier risk because you've lowered it, and you may also need to be looking at additional mitigation actions that you could take advantage of now that you've created momentum within your planning community. Next slide, please. So the reason we ask this is because complexity drives cost. 
if you had lots of green arrows on those earlier slides, you're probably looking at a fairly low complexity plan. You may need little outside support. Um, you may not have any new flood insurance rate maps or other studies. And you might just be able to review the data that you have, make sure it's still accurate, rather than having to analyze new data. The same is true with your other planning components. You will still need to engage with the public and with other stakeholders, but the process is going to be more review than reinvention. Use your resources instead to add best practices and focus on plan integration and outreach. If you had a mix of blue and green arrows from the previous slides, your plan is likely moving towards the medium complexity range. There may be new data to evaluate, and you may need some outside help. You are still required to engage with your stakeholders, including the public, and those meetings may be more involved because you're introducing new information into the planning process. If you had a lot of blue arrows, you're probably looking at a high complexity planning effort. You may need to engage with experts to help you gather new data and understand what it means to your community. You will likely have to reassess the components of your plan in light of the changes that have taken place and will need to take more time than just a simple review. Additional stakeholder meetings may be needed. As you're considering the complexity of your planning project, it's helpful to identify the tasks that will be required for completion. Building a task list should be your next step. Next slide, please. There are two areas, um, major areas of planning that take a lot of time and money. And the, we're going to talk about those next. Um, the first one is um, outreach, uh, uh, engagement and outreach. So for a high complexity project, and that would include a brand new plan if you don't have one already, public outreach and stakeholder coordination has to start with identifying who the stakeholders are and doing some basic homework. You're going to need to know what you want to tell them and how will you do that. You're going to need to create the materials before you can distribute them. You're going to then hold meetings. They may include in-person meetings with the public to inform them about the planning process, or in the case of a com complex update, that what has changed in your community that is triggering this new planning approach. There will likely be several meetings with both specific stakeholders and the general public. For a medium complexity plan or update, your changes in your community might mean new stakeholders. They will need to be brought up to speed. Your outreach materials may need to be revised to include new hazards or vulnerabilities. You will likely need fewer meetings than you would with a new or very complex plan but it may take a fair number of meetings to inform everyone of the changes and compl um, the complete planning process. Since there's already a foundation of knowledge about mitigation planning in the community, you may be able to gather the majority of public input using surveys and with fewer meetings. For a low complexity update, you may just need to update your stakeholder contact list to account for turnover. You may be able to reuse um, previous outreach materials with only minor changes. And the number of meetings will you will need to hold may be fewer if you can rely on online surveys and similar tools. Next slide, please. The second component that costs a lot of money and takes a lot of time is your risk analysis. With a high complexity plan, you are going to need to identify any new hazards that are impacting your community. You're going to need to evaluate what those impacts and extents are for um, previous, um, previously identified risks as well. And you may need to collect additional data and to conduct a hazard analysis. This all takes time and money. For a medium complexity plan, you may need to um, evaluate your list of hazards and perform analysis on changing impacts to your community. 
You may also need to collect additional data and uh, identify um, anything, any gaps, and then incorporate it into the plan. For a low complexity plan, um, perhaps you have no new hazards. Um, but you should be asking yourself if you have any tra changing trends. Um, you should also be looking at if you have any impact to your population. Uh, in the case of all three of these, though, you still must review um, the identified hazards and get feedback from your stakeholders. Understanding the scope of work is the first step to understanding how much time and money it's going to, create to, uh, going to take to create a meaningful plan. Remember that these three things, scope, timeline, and budget, all go together. Next slide, please. So next we're going to um, talk about, we talked about the complexity of your plan development project and whether it's an original plan or a new plan. And now we're going to look at how you plan out your project and with that level of complexity in mind. Next slide, please. So you're going to need to know what the plan requirements are and build these into your scope of work. These are the components that the state and FEMA will be evaluating in their review. And not considering them right from the beginning is going to cause you a lot of heartache later on. So for just a moment, let's take a look at each of these steps. If you'll click, please. So the planning process, you need to ask yourself um, who will be participating in the plan development. If it's a single jurisdiction plan, then you'll need a variety of people from the jurisdiction, including your emergency management community, land use planning, building officials, public works, parks and recreation, et cetera. If you're doing a multi-jurisdictional plan, you're going to need those same people, but from each jurisdiction. And don't forget to include additional stakeholders, like large and small businesses, schools, health, and utilities. These sectors all add an additional voice that will make your plan a lot more robust. Um, you need to also remember that next, if you'll click first, next for hazard identification and risk assessment. Um, you need to be asking yourself, uh, what are the risks and who are at risk? And be looking at what those impacts are. And click again, please. And what is within your power to mitigate the risk? Um, we have a capabilities assessment that communities um, self-assess. And um, that'll give you an opportunity to see what gaps you might have in your program. Next, please, the mitigation strategy. So you'll be creating a mitigation strategy. Um, it's sort of a plan of action on how you're going to create resilience in your community. Next, click, please. Your plan maintenance is going to um, involve probably annual reviews, certainly post-disaster reviews of your plan, and how do you keep that momentum up to actually follow through? And then uh, those last clicks, please. Well, I guess that works enough, and we are on to Brenna. Thank you. Thanks, Mari. All right, so now we're going to walk through this process and some considerations in developing your application for your planning um, planning project. And the reason why I'm saying considerations here is these are really mostly suggestions. And the reason why we suggest a lot of this is because not only will it end up with a great plan, and you'll save yourself, as Mari said, a lot of heartache if you don't follow some basic guidelines, but you will also have a more successful application. And what that means is you're applying for HMA planning grant. And what that means is there will be less contact needed um, with our staff members for in what we call a request for information because um, your, your application will be very thorough. So the first thing you want to start with here is looking at your plan review tool. And you will frequently get these 
uh, after your local FEMA hazard mitigation planner has reviewed your plan. There's going to be some comments on this. Perhaps there's suggestions of what the plan could strengthen. Look at these comments. You'll see from that who will be on the planning team. What tasks are you going to be doing yourself? Are there any agreements needed? Any type of meetings? And then from this planning review tool, tool, tool <laughs> it will also state, as I mentioned, those strengths, the weaknesses, and perhaps you might want to address those in this new plan update. So it's going to start, but by starting with that, you're going to really be able to start um, thinking about how that plan is going to look for your community. All right, so for our timeline considerations, you really want to make sure you're understanding the key tasks of what it means to get that plan update or your FAIRS plan, if that's what it is. Um, frequently, you know, we'll see schedules that maybe are a little too ambitious, a few months six months. You want to really break that down by task. What are those actual tasks that you need to be doing to make sure that not only is your plan written and um, good, but that it gets approved through your state and through your FEMA um, regional office. So you want to make sure that your key tasks are broken out in your timeline. Things like perhaps sending out an RFP for a contractor. Are you going to use a contractor? Perhaps you have an internal staff. And maybe you just need to uh, factor in internal staffing timelines. Do you already know who your steering committee is? Do you need time to perhaps um, create your steering committee, reach out to stakeholders to participate in that steering committee? And you want to also budget here in your timeline for things that can go wrong. Um, there's always going to be delays on um, in our world, right? Whether it's perhaps you have staffing turnover or things like COVID, you know, none of us predicted this. Um, so maybe you want to budget in sometimes just in case there are any um, incidences or disturbances of your original timeline. And what's very important here that I like to highlight is we always recommend you at least budget six months for your review with FEMA to a to account for any revisions that might be needed. We always like to suggest that you always account for revisions. And the reason why is that could be likely, and that way you budget enough time for you to revise that, send it back to your community for those revisions, send it back to FEMA for approval, and then that adoption. And with that adoption, it doesn't always, you know, you think it's easy just to adopt a plan, but sometimes it does take longer than a few days. Maybe your, your community council is only reviewing that, um, reviewing things on certain schedules. So you want to account for that if, uh, actually realistically, too. And here on this next page, you see a sample timeline. This is a pretty great, simple, broken down timeline for, for key tasks. As you can see, there's tasks for just basic things like procuring a consultant, developing that planning team, and then down at the bottom you can already see how they're thinking ahead. They're, they're accounting for their draft, they're accounting that six months for their state and FEMA review or any revisions needed as well. Their local plan adoption, as you can see there, two months, right, because maybe their planning team or, excuse me, their community council, their state council, whatnot, tribal council is not meeting every day. And then um, at the end, very importantly, um, grant closeout. This is something we frequently see forgotten. And you want to make sure you have time, if you're receiving a hazard mitigation assistance grant, to close out that planning grant. So you can, um, as a subrecipient, you can send that to your state, um, and they can finish the closeout process to FEMA. Or if you are a state recipient of that grant, that you budget that grant closeout so you can provide all the closeout materials to FEMA um, and make sure your closeout package is good. And again, that always does take time, so it's important to budget that in. The next thing here is your budget considerations. And you really want to make sure that you're considering all of your costs here. Um, really holistically think anything you could possibly have that goes on for this, uh, this planning grant. 
some things you can think of is like, as I mentioned previously, your print, your grant closeout. That's something that's frequently forgotten in the budget consideration. That's still going to take staff time, right? Um, perhaps you have your financial staff that may need to start looking at all those bills and adding them up, making sure that when you uh, wrap that up in your closeout, that that final figure is correct. So remember, you want to budget all of these little um, these little intricacies you might not have thought of when you just look at the whole picture of the plan. You want to identify staff salary and staff range. This is also a great opportunity down at the bottom as you see identify task hours for all jurisdictions. This is the great opportunity here to think about potential in-kind cost match um, opportunities. For example, if you're an accounting, are you including um, any type of other stakeholders or jurisdictions that their time will count towards um, the plan? Um, if you are, could that, pe could that potentially be in-kind match so you don't have to give cash resources or um, other types? So that's a, really, that's a spot to start thinking about is in-kind resources, both your staff or staff fringe, um, but also any jurisdictions that are participating in their in-kind contributions. So now we're going to go into some really key basics of budget considerations. The first one is pre-award costs. Pre-award costs are um, application development costs. So let's say you are working on that application. You're entering it into FEMA Go, like if you were just in Sean's session. Um, your work doing that. Perhaps you're taking G318. That is the FEMA um, EMI course for planning. So perhaps that's a pre-award cost you'd like to account for. Meetings to just help scope that planning project. Those are things we would consider um, pre-award costs. Now, what we always like to mention here, because it is really important, is what is not a pre-award cost. Starting your plan is not a pre-award cost, so that's really important. Let's say you've started on your risk assessment, that is not a pre-award cost. That would be something that you would want to wait till you have your hazard mitigation grant. Um, so that's not a pre-award cost. Uh, an example there, too, uh, would be analysis of data. So again, like I mentioned, that risk assessment, um, development of outreach materials, that is not a pre-award. So that would be once your grant has been awarded. The next thing we're going to talk about here is your scope of work considerations specifically for your risk assessment. I know Mari kind of talk, uh, spoke about this, but it's important to start looking at your current plan and seeing what's happened in that period. Are there any new hazards that your community is facing that you may have not have thought was a hazard in the past? Maybe you're getting more floods and it wasn't a very big priority to your community then, but now it's starting to be you know, a regular occurrence, and you want to make that section more robust. What type of information has been gained in the past few years? Have you actually had any disaster events that have provided more data for a risk assessment? See if there's any type of additional data that you really might need in your community for this. And you also want to know where that data is coming from. Are you potentially just going to use all data from, let's say, your county? Maybe your county already has a robust risk assessment and has that data available. Or are you perhaps saying, you know, my county doesn't have exactly what I need. Our community is very specific. We need a very specific risk assessment of this one hazard. So, you know, this is your ability to think of one size does not fit all, right? So what does your community need? Did your plan... Um, your, your current plan, does it really address all those risks that your community has adequately? So the next slide here is just some more considerations. And things that we wanted to highlight were like a climate change assessment. Maybe you'd like to include that in your hazard mitigation plan. We really encourage our applicants and sub-applicants to include um, and consider future conditions for their community as they update their hazard mitigation plan. So this is something to think about ahead of time. What can your community include in that plan to consider those future conditions? 
Um, another important thing here is we like to know expensive isn't always better. Uh, just because something's expensive doesn't mean it's going to be great. And likewise, just because something is cheaper doesn't mean it's always the best either. So you really have to analyze what's the best for your community and see what type of analysis will be the best fit for your community opposed to what's, you know, either cheapest or most expensive. What's going to bring the most worth to your community in helping address and bring those hazards to the forefront? All right. All right, so some timeline considerations um, for your risk assessment. You want to determine how long that risk assessment is going to take. And a lot of that depends on, you know, what type of risk assessment you're doing. Are you using existing data? Perhaps you're not. Perhaps your community is doing a new analysis. And that might take longer, right? That might take six months. Are you doing a very in-depth analysis? Are you doing a climate change analysis? That could take a lot more time than a community who perhaps is just using already developed data and a risk assessment. You want to make sure all those tasks are in your scope of work and accounted for in your timeline. So you make sure that you are within that 36 months HMA grant timeline, but also that it's realistic so you know you can keep to your tasks. So again, you want to think about how that risk assessment will be conducted, what, where's that data coming from. Now, some budget considerations for your risk assessment. So you can now reflect on your past update um, or your past plan if it was your first one. Did what was the time and budget for your last risk assessment? Um, did it cost perhaps what you thought? It was it over? Um, you want to think back to that and think, were you happy with it? Perhaps you got a risk assessment that you felt like didn't fully meet that community's needs. Um, so maybe this time around, you might need to budget more for a risk assessment. Have any priorities changed in your community that you might need to focus upon? other hazards and make sure that's accounted for in your budget. And also we like to highlight here, you want to make sure you're associating any cost for the analysis software. Are you perhaps needing to acquire any special software? Are you going in the field um, or perhaps you're hiring contractors to go in the field to do some in-depth analysis of hazards? Um, expert analysis. So what type of uh, you, you really want to think here if there's any type of software, you know, things beyond the basics here that you might need um, that aren't always in that forefront of your mind. All right. So next here is your capabilities assessment and what to um, consider for your scope of work. So the capabilities assessment, you want to make sure how you're thinking about how that plan is going to be put into action. So that plan is going to help you result in, in action, right, in projects, in helping your community be more resilient. So what kind of gaps does your community have? You want to start thinking of those and the capabilities that your community might have or maybe it perhaps does not have. And you also here want to lay that groundwork for the plan integration. So your plan can be integrated into other plan and vice versa. Perhaps you want to make sure you allow enough time and budget and, um, and list as a task in your timeline to incorporate this data um, into other, um, other plans, such as land use plans, comprehensive plans, things like that. And this one is fairly simple as to what I was just speaking to, is you want to make sure that you are considering enough time to identify those gaps um, that could either help or, you know, hinder your actions, your mitigation actions moving forward. In the case of a gap, you know, it could, um, it could hinder, but also maybe your capabilities there. You want to make sure that you are budgeting time for that and making sure that 
you are able to review any type of capability assessments done in your community, whether it's, you know, at um, a natural resource level or whatever um, departments that are key in your community with that plan. All right, so budget considerations for your um, for your assessment, your capabilities assessment. You want to make sure you're considering what type of work is going to be done and who will be doing it. You want to make sure that those complexity of the tasks are identified. Are you going to be out there reviewing capability assessments from different agencies or stakeholders? Um, and you know, something here that we like to highlight too is. Uh, Larger jurisdictions, such as multi-jurisdictions, counties, things like that, they'll include, they'll need more time to assess those capabilities of other jurisdictions, you know, communities that will participate in that plan. What type of financial resources do you need for that? Is your staff doing that? Um, internal staff? Is a contractor doing that? You want to start looking at that, so making sure your budget is actually realistic. So now we are going to talk about the scope of work considerations for your mitigation strategy. So you want to start thinking about here in your mitigation strategy is for any community changes that you want here. What, has there been any changes to your community in terms of the risks or hazards? You want to make sure that you're updating based on that best available data. Is your mitigation strategies the same? Is the priorities the same? Perhaps they're not. As I mentioned, maybe you've, re you've been uh, experiencing more floods and you want to make sure that section is more robust. You want to make sure that your strategy is also in line with your local priorities, policies, ordinances, and programs related to mitigation. So, you know, we know that there's certain local policies that might change different things for each community. So you want to make sure that whatever that strategy is, it helps align with those as well. For example, um, I work with a community who is really robust in their wildfire um, mitigation. So when they update their plan, I bet they're going to be looking robustly at their wildfire ordinances to make sure that also aligns with their strategy of um, mitigating uh, and reducing the impact of wildfires. All right, so timeline considerations for your strategy. You really want to be realistic here. Um, it's easy to say it might take a month to develop your strategy, but you really want to consider in the type of coordination across not only programs, but across agencies and departments in your community that that work will actually take. You also want to think about that coordination potentially across multi jurisdictions, if perhaps you want to do some information sharing, things like that. And as it notes here, departments that will be implementing your mitigation actions. What type of strategy development will, will that um, timeline take? What, will it, what resources and time will it take to help work with those departments who could potentially be implementing those actions that come from this plan? And then really important here, for communities that participate in the National Flood Insurance Program or uh, CRS communities, we really want to make sure that you are budgeting enough time to gather compliance data, because this is important and can help towards your CRS scoring um, from the plan, in the plan, excuse me, can help your CRS score. So make sure that you are thinking about those components as well. All right, so more um, budget considerations, but just for your strategy here. You also, um, for multi-jurisdictions, you want to make sure that you're accounting for that uh, work across those jurisdictions. You know, as we just mentioned in the timeline, if you are working with multiple departments, you're working with multiple communities, you're working cross-jurisdictional to get other information, not only does that take time, but it also takes money, right? What kind of, what kind of staff time is that going to take your community? 
what kind of financial resources do you actually need? You know, it might not just um, take you calling a few jurisdictions. It might actually take a significant amount of time. So make sure you're capturing that in your budget. So now we're just going to discuss briefly some of these additional plan requirements. And again, Mari mentioned these many slides ago, but these are important because if you look at these now before you submit that not only HMA application for a potential planning um, update, but also if you think of these ahead of time before your plan gets submitted to the state or FEMA, you're going to be in a bet, bet much better spot. So you want to make sure that you have a clear maintenance um, schedule for your plan. You want to make sure that it outlines responsibilities, who's to do what, who's updating what, who's monitoring, tracking, so that next update is good. Who is perhaps gathering that data? Is anyone monitoring, tracking, um, you know, keeping, uh, keeping a log of data that you want to include in your next um, mitigation plan, potentially on, has, um, on a hazard that's occurred, things like that. And you want to make sure that the focus is always to help promote that mitigation action. We're wanting, you know, the mitigation plan, think of it as uh, it's the first steps of that um, commitment to action and mitigation. So we want to make sure here that the plan focus is also um, promoting those actions. So next here is um, the evaluation. Sorry, my pages are stuck together, evaluation and plan adoption. We, as I kind of mentioned this um, a few slides ago, but you always want to leave time for evaluation and adoption. So as you budget in your, your timeline, you, you want to make sure that you're leaving six months, a minimum of six months for your state, FEMA review, sending those back, doing those revisions. And then just keep in mind, just go with this attitude that you will have revisions. That way, if you don't, it's perfect. Your timeline is ahead of schedule, right? So always just go in with that idea that you're going to have revisions. Um, and will this perhaps require more staff time, more, um, more financial resources, consultant? Do, will they need to update those and do those revisions? And also, how will that plan be shepherded into adoption? what will be done there, what will, um, who and what will be done in that grant closeout, right? So after that evaluation is done, let's say the plan's ready to be adopted, who and what resources are needed to make sure the plan gets adopted? Um, you know, it's great when you get that letter saying FEMA will approve it once you, um, once you adopt it, but who's going to help make sure your community adopts it? You want to make sure those are um, clear in your plan and you've thought about that ahead of time to make sure that that plan will be adopted. And important, um, you want to make sure that you are um, only adopting a plan after they are FEMA approved. So normally you'll get that, that FEMA, um, what we call an APA letter, approved pending adoption. And that means FEMA has committed to approving your hazard mitigation plan after your community has adopted it. So make sure that your community um, is only adopting it after you get that letter, so that way you don't have to adopt it if there's, um, you adopt it and then have to do revisions and then adopt it again. So it's really important to keep that in mind as well. And lastly here, it's important to think if there's any other state requirements. You might want to check in with your state hazard mitigation officer, what we call a SHMO, <laughs> and see if there's any additional requirements they have. Perhaps your state has some type of policies or ordinances um, that could affect your plan. So you want to make sure you're thinking those ahead of time so those are included and you don't need to think about those, you know, late in the game. So the next thing here we have is a poll. So what other pain points or maybe considerations that you think are important for developing a successful scope of work for a planning application? And you should see this appear right on your screen. Go ahead and feel free to type in your answer 
we love to hear what um, your thoughts are for developing that successful scope of work. We're already seeing some great answers come in. Um, and I'm just going to read some as we, as we go through. Staffing constraints, we see a lot of this. Um, we see here not enough hours in the day, um, perhaps not enough staff, having the staff available to do the task necessary, very important things to think about, right? So maybe in that scenario you want to go through these, these elements and think, okay, we know we're very limited staffing. Who are we going to have as a resource for this? Are we going to contract? Are we going to work with the local university and contract with them? Perhaps some graduate students will be helping out on work. Um, that's a great question, too, here. Do I think about, do I have to run hazards again? Am I using existing as an existing hazards run? Um, or am I per potentially doing a new hazards run? Budgeting, um, thinking of, again, constraints, staffing constraints. Oh, this is a great this is a great point here. I love this one. Not only thinking of your budget, but thinking of staffing constraints and the review of consultants' work or contractors' consultants, um, making sure that once you get that work product, that you have budget and time and that budget for your time to review that work. Right? Because sometimes there are big changes if the consultant or or contractor doesn't. 100% know your community. Maybe there are some tweaks that you guys um, in your community would like to do. Someone says their rural county hasn't changed much in the past five years. And so that's okay. As Mari mentioned, maybe that's a very low complexity update. Maybe much hasn't changed, and that's okay. That update maybe won't be as robust. Maybe you don't need a new hazard um, assessment, or excuse me, a risk assessment. Maybe there's nothing to robustly update, maybe just some new outreach materials you want to tweak. Great point here. Making sure that your budget is clear and lines out also with the task who's going to do what, right? Make sure that people understand who's going to do what. Um, we want to make sure, you know, if, if someone's another agency or department's supposed to do some tasks, they know and they've committed to that and they're okay with that. You want to make sure that's also not only in the timeline, but some budget stuff. Uh, or excuse me, in your budget, um, you've accounted for that in your budget. Oh, okay, here's a good one. How to use new risk map products. Maybe that will take some staff time as well, getting adjusted to some new technologies, new um, risk mask products. Perhaps you're doing an in-house run of hazards, and your staff might need to, you might need to account for that staff time of um, learning it and making sure that they, um, they are, you know, understanding how to do it. We don't know what we don't know. I love that. Yes, you don't know. Um, and, you know, that's why it's always good to budget in some um, time for unexpected things, whether it's minor or large, like COVID. I know right now in Region 10, one of the questions we asked a lot in our planning um, scope of work reviews, so in our RFI stage, the request for information stage, is how are you going to engage the public and your stakeholders right now with COVID? Um, you know, that's something that might seem simple, but a lot of communities may not have thought about. You know, you might not be able to bring a town hall meeting of 300 people together. So those are really, um, really good things to start thinking about. Not enough funding. Yeah. Um, so please check out our hazard mitigation grants so we can help, because um, those can definitely be used to help um, help do your plan update. And that's, you know, our we do have several types of grants that can help address that. CRS requirements and future conditions, super great point there. Um, so thanks for everyone for, for giving those great um, answers. Those are really fantastic. Um, so now we've kind of concluded the session, so we want to make sure we don't run over into uh, anyone else's time. So here we have the next um, and, and last slide is just some mitigation planning resources. 
And you should be able to download this in your, um, uh, on your left and below screen. So you'll be able to download this app, or excuse me, this presentation, and be able to get to these um, links through that. And then we also have HMA grant app, uh, resources here. Some basic resources for just how to get started in your plan, our guidance, which is our main, um, kind of the meat of our programs and how they work, what we require, really recommend taking a look at that. Um, things to consider for your sub-applications, and um, what I really uh, want to highlight too at the bottom is the Tribal Mitigation Planning Grant Development Job Aid. This will help your tribal community and tribal nation think through what type of plan that they are potentially, uh, or excuse me, what type of, um, you know, how, how they're going to develop that scope in their, in their planning application and what level of things to look at and the differences of coming um, into an HMA grant as a, uh, a direct FEMA applicant versus a sub-applicant um, in the HMA grant. All right, and lastly, um, we have our contact information here for Mari and myself at the bottom. Please feel free to reach out to any of us, and we will be happy to share resources with you. Um, again, Mari's in Region 3, and I'm in Region 10. Um, and I think we have a few questions here. But let's uh, Brenna, see. actually, over time, by oh. a big amount. So I think we need to close down this session and move to the next one. I'm so sorry. Okay. No problem. Thank you. Feel free to reach us out to us via that, those emails if you would um, like to ask your question. Thank you. Thank you both. That was awesome. Thank you. So I'm going to move everyone into the polls and have you guys do your polls. So we are about 15 minutes over, we were supposed to be giving you a little break. So what I'd like to negotiate with all of you is that maybe we take like a five or six minute break and start up again about five minutes after the hour. Um, and for Manny and Eric, is that okay? Does that um, take too much away from you? 